Many philosophers have considered the foundations of earthly power. Sometimes we find they're shakier than we imagine, and other times not exactly shaky, more like runny. That was certainly the case in ancient Rome, where the entire economy was more or less based on a liquid. And no, I don't mean wine, it was quicksilver, or to the Romans, hydra argyrum, water silver, sometimes argentum vivum, or living silver. The only metal that remains liquid at room temperature, its quick flowing nature got it associated with the speedy messenger god Mercury, who gave the metal its modern name. The Romans were one of the first civilizations on Earth to mass produce mercury. By the later first century AD, they were using an estimated five metric tons of the stuff per year. Nearly all of that mercury went to one purpose, getting enough money to run the empire. By imperial time, the Roman economy was heavily monetized, meaning you needed cash instead of barter goods. And in the days before dead presidents, cash meant some kind of metal. In Rome, copper and brass were used for everyday low value spending. The high rollers, excuse me, alti convolveri had silver and really large sums traded hands in the form of gold. By the first century BC, most high value international and regional commerce was denominated in the aureus, which as the name implies, was a stamped coin of gold. And it wasn't just commerce either. There were legions to pay. According to Pliny, Julius Caesar financed his wars against Pompey in part by uh, liberating 15,000 Roman pounds of gold ingots from the treasury. In modern terms, that's a bit under one ton. All that gold, plus quite a bit more, was obtained using mercury. It was mercury that enabled the Romans to produce huge amounts of cash with comparatively little effort through a process called amalgamation. Let's back up a bit and look at how that worked. Before mercury amalgamation caught on, methods of obtaining gold in the ancient world fell into two classes, larceny or labor. Now, we know that given the option, most people would take the former, but even stolen gold has to be mined from somewhere, so let's focus on the primary production. Some mining was from placer deposits, which we've covered in another video, but by the Roman Empire, most of these had been mined out and a significant fraction of the production had shifted to conventional mining. Deep underground, miners would swing bronze or iron picks at the rock, heat it with fire and quench it, or drive wedges into pre-existing cracks, all to convince the rock to break. Once it did, they'd load the rock chunks into baskets and carry them up to the surface, where they had to be broken smaller and smaller, and finally ground into a roughly flour-like consistency for the next step in processing. This consisted of panning or sluicing, which separated the dense gold from the lighter quartz or other non-gold rock. Now imagine crushing, grinding, pulverizing, powdering, and panning solid rock all day, every day, and you'll have an idea of what fun gold mining was in the ancient world. The laborious nature of the process didn't deter the Roman plutocrats, since labor back then was cheap and in mines usually involuntary. But they came to be rather annoyed by its inefficiency. In the hard quartz rocks typical of gold deposits, mining rates with hand tools and fire setting are measured in inches advanced per day per tunnel, so not much ore was brought up to the surface to begin with. And once it got there, getting the gold out of it was increasingly a problem. Panning and sluicing work well enough when the gold is relatively coarse grained. Nuggets, in other words, but a lot of finer gold dust is actually so fine that water will simply carry it off with the rest of the rock. Depending on the gold ore and the exact process, gold losses from these gravity separation methods could easily reach 50% in the finer gold typical of the quartz vein type of deposit. Now, that had worked all right in ancient Egypt before the days of coinage when not so much supply was needed. But by about the first century BC, these old inefficient methods of mining could no longer produce enough gold to satisfy increasing Roman demands. 
One suspects that a new fashion for covering palace ceilings with gold leaf may have had something to do with this, but whatever the causes, the gold supply had gone as far as it could with the existing technology, and clearly it was time for a change. Mercury turned out to be the miracle worker. It's one of the very few chemicals that was both available in the ancient world and capable of dissolving gold. Mix gold with mercury and the gold will dissolve into it along with any silver it contains in a process called amalgamation. Meanwhile, base metals and the rest of the rock will be completely unaffected. This enabled the Romans to develop what was in essence the world's first leaching system. They would still have to mine the ore and bring it up to the surface in chunks, but instead of grinding it to a powder, they would grind it just a little and then place it in a container and pour mercury over it, then leave it to soak for a while. The mercury would wend its way through the rock, dissolving gold and silver but nothing else as it percolated through to the bottom. The miners would then decant the resulting mercury gold silver amalgam from the container and boil it. Mercury vaporizes easily with heat, but gold and silver don't, so the mercury would vanish and the gold and silver would be left for collection and refinement. It also proved possible to recover at least a little bit of the mercury by condensing it again out of the vapor. Just to be clear, this amalgamation process is not used in modern industrialized gold mining due to environmental and public health concerns. But being the technology enthusiasts of the ancient world, the Romans took to mercury amalgamation with gusto. By 77 AD, the quicksilver mines at Almaden in the province of Hispania were producing something like four to five metric tons of mercury every year from cinnabar or mercury sulfide ores, virtually all of it being used to amalgamate gold. The amalgamation process required about twice as much mercury by weight as the gold it could produce, not counting any recycling, so that represents at minimum two and a half metric tons of gold each year, or on the Julius Caesar scale, enough to fund about three civil wars per annum, which in certain years was just about right. The influx of gold, along with associated byproduct silver, transformed Rome from a poor but formidable military republic into a gold-plated monarchy that ruled most of the known world. But use of a resource breeds dependence, and Rome was no exception. Early on, the Romans of the Republic could have cared less about gold. Their money was based on copper and brass, and only the richest patricians even possessed any silver. At the point when Rome became a de facto empire in the late first century BC, the economy had grown, Roman territory had expanded, and Rome simply couldn't do without a large and steady supply of gold. After all, it takes money to engage in trade, pay armies, pay off barbarians, subsidize allies to stay allies, bribe senators, build aqueducts and roads, and maintain a supply of golden chamber pots for the likes of Antony and Cleopatra. You know, the important stuff. As a matter of fact, it was Rome's huge appetite for gold that would help to do it in. Geology could not create ore deposits as fast as Roman demand consumed them, and after a while, the mines of Hispania began to run out of metal. We can't be certain about gold because it wasn't smelted, but metallic dust released by the smelting of other metals blown to Greenland on the wind and preserved in ice cores show that Roman mine production was in a steep decline by the third century AD. Historical records are fragmentary, but those that survive tell the same story. After about 200 AD, the Roman metal supply was in deep trouble, as the mines became exhausted of their metal or had to be abandoned after reaching depths that even the Roman engineers couldn't pump water out of. And because metal was money, the Roman money supply was in the same trouble. Page after page in the histories of the time chronicle the emperor's increasingly frantic efforts to raise money by devising new taxes, subsidizing mining, and eventually hauling jugs of olive oil across the Sahara to trade it for West African gold. A few of the really desperate ones even went so far as to trim their banqueting expenditures. 
but none of those would solve the fundamental problems of an economy that kept needing more and more gold, but had less and less of it coming out of the mines. As the money supply faltered, so did Rome's ability to maintain armies and alliances. The decline and fall of the Roman Empire had many causes, but difficulties in getting metal and money were major contributors to them. The classical glories of Rome may have been built on gold, but their foundations turned out to be as fluid as mercury.